um, welcome. And to those here on the phone, equally welcome. I'm also based here in Hong Kong, but it's just been a horrible wet day. And, um, and so I decided to kind of head home and take this call from home rather than down at the campus. But it's great to see that there are people there in, this, in the actual campus facility as well. And, uh, and super to be here. So I'm going to take a few minutes, maybe about 15 or 20 minutes, just to walk through some viewpoints and what's really happening within the alternative investments industry and why that's um, proving to be such a big pool at the moment. Um, and then talk a little bit about the Kaya curriculum and indeed the Kaya qualification. And then thereafter, look forward to introducing Larry to give you a, a feel for all things prep course if you don't feel that you could study by yourself and uh, want to lean into that great expertise that Larry and his team have there at Kaplan. So for us here at Kaya, we are a 20 year old organization. We just had our, we literally are having our 20th anniversary this year. And um, we now have some 12,000 plus members in over 100 countries. And the growth of our members is absolutely closely aligned to where that growth of assets under management has come and grown to in the alternative investments industry. Our job is to seek better outcomes for investors. Um, and therefore we feel that, you know, using the entire risk return curve from an investment perspective is really important. Um, and that's what we really stand for from a mission perspective. We do three things. We have the Kaya Charter, as you see here. So once you progress through the two levels of the program, one becomes qualified and you the digital badge. Um, we also have a fundamentals of alternative investment certificate or an FAI, a lighter touch. So for some of you more senior here this evening, for your more junior staff, who are a little bit less seasoned or a little bit less familiar with how the industry works, the certificate program is a great way to get kind of up to speed on what's happening and some of the verbiage and some of the core concepts of what we therefore look at as far as the certificate is concerned. Um, and then thirdly, and most recently, we launched a financial data professional um, charter, which is really bringing together that connection between data science and financial investments. You can't walk onto a trading floor. You can't walk into an asset management scientist, trying to trawl through lots and lots of data and attempt to provide some investment um, signals or some investment insights and some kind of behavioral insights and observations. And really the FDP um, digital um, program is really about providing some um, competence rubber stamping around that particular qualification. But we're here to speak about Kaya and um, I'm keen to say of those 12,000 members, we really have members across the entire ecosystem, GPs, LPs, banks, consultants, the big asset owners, the big sovereign wealth funds and the regulators. It's those guys that are building the blueprint to see what happens within the financial services sector in their local market. Um, and that's really where we see our members from top to bottom across the different industries. Also important is, is the service intermediaries, the custodians, the lawyers, the auditors. Again, as more and more clients are looking at all the investments, we're seeing the service intermediaries needing to expand their competence and looking for Kaya to help them with that. And equally, what you're seeing now is in many job applications, there's the word preferred has kind of crept in. So brilliant for those in the room that have their CFA. It's a fantastic program. Ditto for FRM. But now to highlight your competence in private markets or alternative investments, working towards or having your Kaya is seen as being a requirement. If we think about what were the old fashioned long only fund management GPs, they've now acquired so many other businesses in recent years and recent months. What was a traditional long only house with a fixed income focus, for example, is now multi asset focused, having acquired I know, a private equity firm or a private credit firm. So having a broader range of skills as individuals is only going to get um, more and more required. We believe it's a, a really beginning to cause um, some havoc and some worries for investors. And maybe that brings us to the why, why alternative investments. And so I think we all know what they are. It's pretty much anything that isn't long only. So anything that isn't a bond or an equity or a cash investment really sits around what is alternative. 
that's natural resources, that's real estate, private credit, infrastructure, and also hedge funds as far as what makes up the um, sector, private equity and venture capital. And the key features when we think about what therefore looks at um, public versus private, here we know that the individuals can typically buy into Wall Street and arguably with, uh, with uh, private markets, it's a little bit more difficult to get access there. Um, regulation is rather different from left on the public markets to right on the um, traditional or the alternative markets. And then limited liability is definitely in place for listed investments in the public world. Um, there's unlimited liability, as I'm sure we've all heard some of the horror stories over the years about things that happen in the private market sector. But what's really fueling this appetite and this excitement in the private sector or the talent investment sector is finally investors are recognizing diversification is a good thing. You know, decade and a bit but, uh, uh, kind of past, you could have bought a, a, a long only ETF index future, gone home and done nothing for years and made an awful lot of money. Um, unfortunately, those days have gone. Um, diversification now is a really real thing and a very important thing. Having access to different risk drivers and return drivers in the balanced portfolio is becoming more and more important. Um, alpha is um, obviously always um, something people are hunting. Again, that was very Easter in the bull market run we've had the last kind of decade and change. Inflation's coming. Geopolitical worries are unfortunately here. We've had a really odd few years to, to, to kind of use a weird word for all things COVID. But suddenly the world's recognising that alternative investments are important and we need to kind of get more of them into our investment portfolios. And that's really made this graph um, really grow since back in 2010 to the projections for 2025. Asset growth will be fourfold or almost four and a half fold here, but even more recent numbers showing how much money will be in alternative investments by the end of 2026. If these numbers here were projecting 18 trillion by 2025, that's already grown in just the last few months to some 23 and a half trillion dollars from today's baseline of about 12 and a bit, 13 billion a trillion dollars that sit in alternative investments globally at this point. For us here in Asia, the future is more than bright. Um, the CAGA of growth we're going to explore and experience is just delightful when we compare this to what we're seeing around the rest of the world, be it the Americas or Europe or Latin America. The growth we're gonna see here is really quite something and quite exceptional. And no surprise, that's driven by the GDP. Yes, there's some headwinds as far as China and indeed India are concerned. However, the GDP of Asia absolutely surpassed that of the rest of the world, with the 19th century being all over to British imperialism, the 20th belonging to the Americas. The 21st century really is for us here in Asia, it's the Asian century. And that's being driven by four main groups of activities. And I've kind of, I like letters, so I've split them across four M's. Millennials, there's lots of millennials here. There's over 800 million um, versus just 66 million in the Americas and just 60 across the whole of the EU. Um, there's a really appetite to invest and do business and be entrepreneurial within that overall cohort globally. And with more than 10 times of them here in our region, that's going to really funnel some great growth and some great opportunities. Our middle class, yes, there's been some headwinds and yes, there's some, seriously some challenges there. But the overall middle class growth that we've seen in recent years will definitely come back and grow to these numbers that are being proposed. And that's of the, the, the next 10 billion middle class individuals around the world. Nine billion of those will be here in the Asia Pacific. And with that comes a phenomenal consumer spending, purchasing power, overlay of some great things that we're going to see change and activities occur as far as that middle class growth across the region. 
The third M is metropolitan. So yes, I think we've all um, benefited from living in cities. Um, I think there's been a bit of pushback around the world on that, um, notably the last couple of years given COVID. Um, but these density high populations have definitely proven good for businesses to grow and good for things to happen. And with over 300 cities with more than a million people here in Asia compared to 10 in the Americas and 18 in Europe, I think we're still on for some pretty interesting growth ahead. And then finally is mobile enhanced. So we've got over 4 billion phone subscribers, over 2 billion internet users. And this is whole kind of democratization and digitalization comes through. We're seeing some amazing things happen. We're going to leapfrog technology here compared to the rest of the world. And that means we can leave those very old systems that the West are unfortunately being anchored down by and dragged back by when we can kind of almost leapfrog across those to put great new things in place and build some really interesting solutions. And that's why this whole, do we go public, do we go private? The world really is recognizing that we actually need both. And by needing both, if we're working in finance, we want to provide advice, we want to have a, 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 you know, a good understanding of what's going on, We've got to be able to, to discuss that entire risk return curve of investments, be it public or indeed private market investments. And what's fueling this is, is this, and these numbers just so much money is continuing to be enjoyed in that private space. So look here at, um, you know, look at here at Facebook. All that wealth was therefore taken on in the private space versus the public post that stock being listed. Look at what happened for Uber. The exact same thing, all shareholders from here to here compared to what happened when the actual stock was listed. And the pie charts there show, you know, Google um, raised just $25 million privately versus um, kind of two point or almost $2 billion at IPO. By the time you kind of hit Uber, they took on um, just $8 billion, uh, in a private space. Um, compared to what they took on publicly. So the world's really kind of changing and we need to be ready for that. And that really to talking about what's happening within the Kaya qualification. And here, the examination itself is a two-level exam. We really think about the first part of the exam being an analyst's approach to looking at alternative investments. We introduce the core concepts. We introduce the basic principles of what makes up alternative and private markets and a really thorough and deep dive into the different disciplines of how and what make up the alternative investments industry. Um, from a topic perspective, there's seven different areas that we look at as far as the curriculum is concerned in the examination, um, from ethics all the way through to the different kind of core pillars of the alternative investments industry. Um, thinking about the examinable one, the whole thing is multiple choice and um, it's two two hour papers to get familiar and to test your understanding of how the um, how the level one curriculum is built. And then moving on from level one, we move to level two. And we think about this more about the, the allocators approach. So if, if level one is all about the what, level two is about the how. So how do I make investments? How do I conduct due diligence? What happens to my investment portfolio when I put different things within it? So we look at the whole kind of coefficient frontier, the risk, the return, a really decent dive into how um, investments behave and what really happens in your investment portfolio when you put these sorts of things within your investment groups as well. Due diligence is a very um, large part of what we teach within the program as well and look at those more complex strategies. So at the end of it, you're able to therefore look at, a, uh, look at an investment review it, understand it, and invest in it in a, a convincing way. And then if we think too about the topics, what we teach within the program, again, ethics is consistent across both level one and level two. And then there's a whole slew of areas there which we look at, be it risk, be it the different methods of accessing investments, um, and indeed the due diligence and the selection strategy can follow and indeed some of the more complex and volatile type in strategies. And maybe not unsurprising, given the fact that level two is all about the allocator, as we see here, what we're therefore doing in level two is, yes, half the paper is multiple choice, but the other half of the paper is constructed responses. So there's two to our papers for level two, 
half is multiple choice so say and then half is essay questions we've got a great learning platform so if you want to read the curriculum and learn about the curriculum that's all available via our new digital platform which we have crafted and built um, and that's something which we definitely encourage and yes there's some brilliant tools available to help you and augment your studies such as the courses provided by Kaplan, our longest uh, serving partner globally and indeed here in Asia. Larry and his team do some brilliant work to help students through and uh, get ready to sit down and take that examination. But there's also great tools that Kaya have built to help you to supplement your learning and your understanding. Now, I'm not sure whether anybody here this evening is a CFA charter holder. If you are, um, the great news is you're eligible to skip level one and um, the analyst approach and move straight through to level two um, and acquire the, um, the level two examination to become a Kaya member. So I'll, I'll ask Christy and Larry in a second to point me in the direction if there are um, CFA members here as well, because you can therefore move straight through via the stacking program to take advantage of the, C, uh, the Kaya program. As I mentioned, lots of tools available from Kaya to help you, be it workbooks where we look at um, keywords and study guides and learning objectives. We have some great webinars. We had one today actually as well um, for our candidates and indeed the third party prep courses such as the team here at Kaplan. Um, we want big access to kind of key banks and, and different things there as well. Um, really something that the team here at Kaplan can help you with. But an awful lot of material available at Kaya on those support tools to help you to be successful and uh, progress through that examination. And how do you do? Well, I always get asked, and I know Larry always asks me to make sure we include this in the presentation. So here you can see the historical pass rates for our level one and our level two candidates for the last, what, eight, nine exam cycles. We just had our March exams, the exams are sat twice a year. 49% um, of our level one candidates passed. Um, and 58 of those that sat level two passed the examination. So we're welcoming in another um, round of um, members into our family um, on the back of the results we published just last week. And I think that's why I love this, this session with Kaplan. They sit here saying, OK, it's May, May 2022. If you sign up and take your level one in September, um, for example, and pass, and then sit for your March 2023 level two, by this time next year, you would have been a member for at least a couple of weeks because we posted the level two results a few weeks back. So, yes, a good deal of work um, to kind of get through the program in 12 months. But if you sit in here saying, OK, my job requires a bit more understanding around private markets. I'm just hearing much more about it now. I want to kind of future proof myself. I want to get a bit more familiar. We're really saying that you can do that within 12 months. And if you are a CFA member, you can do it within about six or eight months. So um, if you're destined to kind of look at new skills this year, this is going to be something that will help you through that program. Cost wise, there is a fee to enroll of $400. And then the exam itself is 1250. And these are US dollars versus our hometown here, Hong Kong dollars, um, that gives you that fee um, number. We are in the early bird registration period right now, right through to, I think, May 16th. And, um, so you can take advantage of that if you've not yet registered and you, and you plan to. Um, and indeed, that's the same cost for both level one and level two. And then unfortunately, if you weren't successful, there is a retake fee, but it's just $450. So we really want you to be successful and progress through. Um, and then the readings are outlined there as well. And then through to membership and getting that digital badge to have that on your name card. Some dates here. Um, we're open for registration for the September exam now, as I mentioned. That early bird window closes in a few days on, on May the 16th. But you've got time to think about that. And regular registration is actually open right through to August the 8th. And then the exams themselves this year for level one will be from the 29th of August through the 9th of September. And then for level two, um, those exams will be sat from the 12th of September through the 23rd of September. We have a huge amount of resources on the website um, for Kaya. If you're not familiar or haven't looked at some of the, the webinars and the educational events that we host, do please take a look. There's some really great research 
Um, we just co-authored, I co-authored a, a white paper on the India market just recently. We just launched a brilliant piece on the portfolio for the future. Look at where we think portfolios and investments will go. So if you're looking to kind of keep current and up to speed with things that are actually happening in the alternative investments industry, I encourage you to take, take a look at some of the things that we have available in our community. As I mentioned, some of those headline pieces here, um, that portfolio for the future, the future of alternatives, a huge big resource on due diligence, and that's getting more and more complicated. Um, tokenization, again, um, gosh, we, we collaborated with BNP. Um, I co-authored that as far as access to investments around democratization, something I'm phenomenally passionate about. Access to all is a good thing. Um, and all investors should have access to alternative investments. And of course, ESG, there's so much happening in that sector as well that we think is very important for the alternative investments. With that, I think I will pause the code. We encourage you to, to, to scan this and join the Kaya APAC landing page and learn a little bit more about the stuff that we're doing. Um, but as ever, I thank the Kaplan team for inviting Kaya to be here. Um, Kaplan are a super partner and uh, a great um, advocate for the different um, examinations here for the Kaya curriculum. And Larry is at the absolute helm of that as a as the tutor. So I'll pass across to Larry at this point. Larry, lovely to see you. Happy Wednesday. Okay. Wow. Thanks, Larry. Well, long time no see. I know. It's crazy, hey? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. crazy. It's been friends. really a long time. Yeah, I miss all these uh, functions and uh, seminar uh, organized by uh, Joe uh, in Hong Kong. It was uh, fabulous. I miss it too. I promise you. It's just crazy how it, it's yeah. just crazy. We can't kind of get to. Please God, things have changed, right? So things are looking up. So hopefully we'll get together soon. But it's lovely to see you, Larry. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's lovely to see the strong growth of Kaya. Uh, in the past Thank couple you. of years, we got uh, twelve thousand members worldwide. Yeah, in you know, hundred countries. And now coming to the 20th anniversary. Yeah, I think we should have a big celebration, right? Yeah, well, in fact, I fly to New York tomorrow. So I'll be at, in Kai headquarters next week. So I'll suck up my quarantine to get back to Hong Kong. But um, it'll be my first business trip in about two and a half years, which is oh. crazy. So I'll be there in next week for our, our, our um, anniversary. So I'll give you guys a wave from social media. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. I'll mute myself and pass it across, Larry. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to this um, uh, seminar. Uh, okay. It's been a very uh, excellent presentation by Joe, uh, giving us the update on the Kaya and also the industries, uh, particularly on the alternative investments. So uh, what I would like to do today is, um, well, probably I have to introduce myself first. Uh, I'm Larry. Uh, here I am. Yeah, I'm a lecturer at Kaplan's, right? responsible for both these uh, Kaya courses and also the CFA courses. And uh, I used to work in the capital markets and also in the asset management houses. Uh, I've been a fund manager for multi-asset portfolio, the traditional ones. But I also have some experience to um, be a product specialist for um, different types of alternative investment products, including the hedge funds and private equities. So hopefully I can make use of all this um, experience to help you to prepare and uh, also get through the exam. And um, maybe in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I can share with you some of this, um, 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 the the details of the examination structures and what is included in the curriculum. And then I will share with you some of this, um, uh, the materials that we used uh, for the classes at Kaplan, uh, how we prepare for the exam. And then I will pass it to my colleague, uh, Christy. And uh, Christy got uh, all the details and, uh, and uh, information for you, yeah, how to make use of the resources at Kaplan yeah, for the exam preparations. And now, um, as Joe mentioned before, well, it is an um, um, increasingly popular area uh, in the industry it's talking about alternative investments, right? It accounts for these um, investable assets um, uh, increasingly. And um, our students coming to our classes is also from uh, different walks of life, right? Some of them are from uh, companies, 
it's like um, and uh, some others is like um, uh, from sales and marketing yeah, uh, from the retail bank uh, private bank and some others are from the from the buy side right they they, they are uh, probably is the analyst uh, of uh, some fund houses uh, specializes in alternative investments and uh, it's really a mix um, background of our students here yeah, coming to our classes and uh, of course they have uh, different expectations from our uh, from the classes and that is what we try to do we want to come up with something which is uh, helpful for our students yeah no matter what their backgrounds is uh, there could be some areas that they are not familiar with we try to help them to learn as uh, as fast as soon as possible yeah because we don't have much time right if we if you talk about this um, the exam died in September and our class will probably start in July so we will spend about two months to prepare for it yeah so one of the areas that we really want to focus is how to learn the whole curriculum yeah uh, in a such short period of time yeah efficiently and uh, these are the background which I would like to just uh, skip and uh, okay we, we come straight to this um, examinations curriculum right for level one and level two yeah so probably today we focus on the level one for the level one as Joe mentioned is it's like an analyst approach yeah we we'll look at all these um, uh, different types of alternative investments real assets private equity hedge funds and structured products right and uh, we want to have a very good understanding of what they are and uh, what they do for us and uh, different alternative investments might have uh, different functions right if we go back to the presentation of Joe right um, it's not just about returns investments uh, can achieve various things right diversifications um, income generations or might be inflation hatch and each of these alternative investments might have a different functions in these areas so when we go through this uh, one by one we need to know how it works and what their functions are and also what are their limitations um, in terms of this um, uh, uh, some kind of a disadvantages to the investors yeah you know, depending on the situation okay that is one part of it the other part of it is there's the introductions to alternative investments um, based on our experience with the students in the classes uh, it is not just an introduction well actually it is quite demanding it's quite demanding and uh, the waiting for this section is also pretty high uh, it includes all different types of uh, uh, the overview of the alternative investments industries and also yes about um, uh, the concept of return the concept of risk okay and also various type of uh, statistical um, applications uh, which we would apply to the investments well basically it is the same for both traditional investments and also alternative investments um, and also some of it are quite quantitative as well right there are a little bit of equations there uh, calculations as well and therefore uh, students mostly are very concerned yeah do they need to have a quantitative background to tackle this yeah but I would say that um, the focus of the exam is more on the conceptual level right of course you need to understand the equations you need to understand how it works but don't worry about all this uh, uh, the modelings or the lumber crunching and uh, this are not the focus of the exam right so come back to my earlier points that we only have about two three months to prepare yeah we need to know we need to focus as to what is the required in the exam so that we can better prepare for it okay later on I will share you share with you some materials related to this part introduction to alternative investments just to to um, to illustrate my point right we have to understand the concepts right and uh, the quantitative part is uh, um, will come will follow laterally and uh, well that is the second second level right once that you know all these uh, different alternative investments then you'll be in a position to put them together uh, how does it fit into your traditional portfolios and um, um, for different investment objectives and constraints yeah from different investors like uh, different institutional investors okay 
Uh, okay, these are the fees. These are the pass rate. Okay, coming back to Kaplan, right? Yeah, I want to emphasize. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we have a very mixed background. Yeah, among our students here, and what we try to do is helping our students to expedite their study. Right. Uh, <clears throat> The curriculum is quite uh, comprehensive, I would say. Right? It is not easy. It is not easy. It is not, um, uh, especially for those that are not yet in the industries. You might spend some time to go through and understand um, um, uh, the scenarios, the situations um, uh, described in the curriculum. And that is what we can help our students, right? Yeah, put our students into the positions to understand all these different litigities of the curriculum. Yeah. And um, save your time, uh, increase your chance of success um, within a relatively short period of time. Well, of, and of course, yeah, we also demand our students to work hard as well. And therefore, we say that well, it is not an easy course. It is intensive, honestly. It is quite intensive. And uh, we have the classes uh, over the weekend. Usually, it's a Saturday. It is the whole day. Um, yeah, because our students, most of them are working yeah, during the week, so we only have the weekend. Yeah. Well, so we focus our classes on the weekend, uh, the full day courses, so it is quite uh, demanding, so be prepared for it. And uh, we provide the, cl um, the materials and also the slide packs for our students to prepare. And the slide pack will be something, okay, before we go into the material, let's take a look of the curriculum. Yeah, I, I just want to um, highlight how we look at the requirements of the exam here. And here is about the uh, measures of risk and performance. Performance is uh, like the return. Yeah, but we don't just look at the returns, we look at the risk as well. Yeah, in particular for alternative investments, right? there are different strategies to, uh, to manage the, the risk and the return. And here it is about this concept called value at risk. Okay. Um, and you see all these the bullet points. Yeah, bullet points are the requirements. Yeah, the requirements are of the curriculum for the students to learn. Okay. So for this value at risk, is this a, a measure of the risk? Yeah. And there are more than one approach to do this measurement. Yeah. So it highlight this a parametric approach. Yeah. And apart from that, uh, there could be. Um, others type of analysis that can also be used yeah, for the estimation of the value at risk. Okay. So value at risk is a concept that we need to learn yeah, um, and also need to uh, manage the calculations. And apart from that, we have to be careful. Yeah, Under different situations, it's occurred or based on the historical data, this kind of um, uh, uh, different approach in the measurement of the VAR we also need to know. And also once that we have um, managed the concept of the VAR of an investments, we need to put it together just like a portfolio, right? Aggregate yeah, all these different investments into a portfolio. And then from a portfolio perspective, again, yeah, we have to determine the VAR. Yeah. And uh, with this calculation and the concept, what are the assumptions behind? Okay, so you see there are a lot of different things yeah, required the students to learn related to this one single concept. Okay, so we are not going through all these different uh, requirements, or maybe I pick one or two here, like for example, the parametric approach. When we say parametric approach, yeah, that means we rely on certain parameters yeah, of the investments to work out the value at risk. Okay? So what do we mean by value at risk? The value at risk is a measure of, yeah, it's either it's the maximum loss yeah, uh, over a specified period, so that is part of the parameters, and also with a specified probabilities. So. So it's like a confidence. If I tell you that I have a confidence the maximum loss that I might incur in coming months is about 10%. Okay. That is, is kind of a value at risk concept. Yeah. Uh, of course, it depends on the confidence required. So on average, the mean return, if we say the mean return is like uh, uh, 
ten percent. Okay, ten percent. Okay, it is a positive figures. But then again, it is not guarantee. Sometimes we earn more, right? More than ten percent. Sometimes we earn less, less than ten percent. Okay. So there's a chance that okay, it might become a negative figures. Yeah. Of course, the chance of our investment outcome being negative, yeah, might not be very high. So we need to have some kind of models to tell us yeah, what could be the probabilities. So here we rely on this is a normal distribution, right? Okay, don't don't worry about this if you don't know what a normal distribution is. Yeah. So basically, it tells us that most of the time, yeah, the probabilities of achieving the average return is the highest. Okay, that is the highest, uh, most likely outcomes. And sometimes we earn more, yeah. But the probabilities, as indicated by the height of this um, uh, the function, is pretty low. So that means to have a very extremely good result, the probabilities is unlikely. It is pretty low. And similarly, for a very very lousy performance, the probabilities is also very very low. So with this concept, we are just trying to tell um, maybe our clients, yeah. To go down to such a very bad returns, right? What could be the probabilities? And that relates to what we mean by the confidence here. Okay, so the confidence here is like, uh, okay, this is the, um, the the probabilities that I might incur a loss uh, more than more than this measure, the VAR. So I can say, yeah, uh, with ninety percent. Okay, here might be a ninety percent confidence that my maximum loss, yeah, does not exceed this level, or maybe I can say here is the ten percent chances that my losses might exceed that level, yeah. So if I say ten percent chances that I might exceed that level, I turn it around and saying that that is my minimum loss. So it depends on how you phrase it. You can say it is the maximum loss with 90% confidence, or 10%. Um, well, we call it significance. Uh, that our minimum loss uh, could be at that level. So that's what we mean by is a power metric approach using these normal distributions. Yeah, to um, to indicate the probabilities. Yeah, of achieving or maybe uh, incurring that losses. So once that we have to determined to use this approach, okay, then we can do some uh, well, it's pretty straightforward calculations. So the losses will depends on yeah a few things yeah yes, this is the standard deviation right standard deviation is the nature of our investments okay or might be in a sometimes we call it is the <coughs> volatility yeah. The more volatile the investments that we put our money into, yeah, the higher could be the losses. Okay, so of course our VAR is based on the standard deviations, right? And of course it depends on how much confidence, yeah, that we want to give to our clients. So if I want to say, okay, I have a, a eighty percent confidence, yeah, then. The maximum loss would not be that much. If I want to have a higher confidence, the maximum loss will be higher. Yeah, this is the potential loss. If I want to increase the level of confidence, I have to increase the potential maximum loss. So that is what this C value is about. So a C value to indicate our level of confidence, the standard deviation to indicate the volatility of our investments, and also the last bit is the over what Period. Okay. The longer the period that we are talking about, the larger is the potential loss. Okay. So we have to times the square root of the number of days. Okay. So don't worry about the square root. Later on, you'll see why. So with this equation, very simple equations. As long as you understand what each of the component of the equation stands for, yeah, you put it together like this. Yeah. Then you can work out the answer. So that is the calculation part. So I think. Uh, it is not difficult. Yeah, the difficult is before we do the, this calculations. How do we understand the concept and put these various things together? And also, this power metric approach is only one of the approach 
for this concept, we, are, we have other approaches as well that, that needs to be learned. And, uh, and also another thing is about uh, how we put these uh, different investment VAR together. You remember it's the, in the portfolio. Yeah. And here we want to highlight another concept here. It's about the diversification. Yeah. If we put different assets or investments in the portfolio, for example, we have only two assets here. Yeah. So with, if these two assets are highly correlated, that means when they make games, they make games together yeah, to the same extent. And when they have losses, they have losses together. So they move together. If they move together, OK, correlations is one. And the risk, the maximum loss is the sum of the individual VARs. OK, that's low diversification, just the sum. If they move in different direction, that means the correlation is negative one. OK, so one make gains, one make loss, they offset each other. OK, that is a pretty good case because that is a perfect diversification and the VAR becomes zero. OK, so that is another thing that we need to discuss during the class. And apart from this VAR, I want to highlight another topic. Yeah, it is also under this uh, introductions to alternative investment sections. Um, financial economics, right? That, that includes a, a, a few things. But here it is about the derivative options. Yeah. Under these topics, we are going to learn the, um, uh, the characteristics of options, yeah, how it works. Yeah. When we learn how it works, we have to understand a few terms. How do we long? How do we short? For options, it could be a call option, it could be put options, right? If it is a call option, you have the right to buy something in the future at a predetermined price. Yeah. And uh, uh, on the other hand, if this is a put option, you have the right to sell something in the future at a predetermined price. Okay. So once that uh, we have grasped these the basic ideas, knowing what they are, so we have to find out yeah, what is the payoff yeah, by different combination of this. If we have a long call options, long call options on the underlying, so it's like a call option on Hang Seng Index. The Hang Seng Index is the underlying. So when the underlying prices increase, we have a call option. We have the right <coughs> to buy the Hang Seng Index at a predetermined price, and that is the strike price. Yeah. So usually you make a profit okay, going up. But then again, if it comes down the other way, yeah, uh, you don't have to buy. You have the right to buy, but you don't have to buy. And therefore, all you will lose is only this, the premium for the call options. Okay. So that is the beauty of the options, right? You can enjoy the upside, but with limited downside. And for uh, if you short, if you short the call option, okay, the payoff will be the opposite. Okay, so you see the similar things here. Yeah, that is a um, a put option. You long a put. You long a put is uh, when the stock price goes down. Yeah, yeah, you make profit. Okay, yeah. So you you can you can sell the Hang Seng Index in our case at a price predetermined. Yeah, which is well in the past must be higher because the market is now uh, coming down. So you make a profit, okay? So you can use the put option to hash your exposure, yeah. But of course, if the stock price goes up, you have to give up this. That is the price you pay for the premium. Sorry, that's the price you pay for the put. That is the put premium, the put premium. So we understand all this graph, then we can move on to put all these different features together. Yeah, you can make use of different call, put, long, short positions to come up with this, what we call option strategies. So in the class, we need to go through these option strategies one by one to understand why do we do it. All right, yeah. So, and also during the class, we'll have some exercise to do. Right? Just reinforce our learning and understanding of the topics, okay. And um, well, I am not going to do this uh, exercise here today. Yeah. But I can let you know the answer. Yeah. If you if you are so interested, okay, be my guest. Take a look of the question and see the, whether you understand why C is the answer. Okay, that's all I want to um, talk about today. 
and um, I, I stick around. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. And uh, in the meantime, yeah, I uh, pass the stage to my colleague Christy. Yeah, and she will introduce to you more details of the carbon resources.